Yes, good afternoon and thank you for joining us today for frauds, failures and bailouts from the savings and loan crisis to the current state of financial regulation. Uh, please note that this event is being recorded and live streamed. Uh, I'd first like to thank all of our sponsors, the Tax Law and Financial Regulation Student Associations, the Harvard Law Forum, the Dean of Students Grant Fund, and the Modern Money Network. Also a big thanks to Real Progressives for live streaming this talk on their Facebook page. My name is Danny Safransky and I'm a member of the Tax Law and Financial Regulation Student Association as well as the president of the Modern Money Network here at Harvard Law School. The Modern Money Network aims to bring accurate and accessible knowledge of our monetary and financial system to the broader public and I think the purpose of the Tax Law and Financial Regulation Student Association is self-explanatory. Um, if you'd like to know more about future events for either org, please send me an email at dsafransky at jd18.law.harvard.edu. I realize that's a mouthful. It's on the board. Um, I am delighted to introduce today Bill Black, a former regulator, a lawyer, a criminologist, and a professor of economics and law at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and a distinguished scholar in residence at the University of Minnesota. Professor Black is an expert on fraud, a word that's often avoided by economists and lawyers alike. As a regulator during the savings and loan crisis, Professor Black saw firsthand the destructive force of frauds and the failures of politicians, economists, and others who are supposed to know better to identify and put a stop to them. And in some cases, they actively made them worse. He is the author of The Best Way to Rob a Bank is to Own One and developed a concept of control fraud, which I'm sure we will be discussing today. Since the savings and loan crisis, he has advised politicians and leaders around the world on how to deal with fraud, corruption, and financial crises. Please join me in welcoming Professor Bill Black. So that's quite a list of groups. Thank you all. I'm not going to try to repeat. Uh, and thank whoever arranged the weather. Because uh, when you come from Minnesota, it just feels like home. <laughs> today in Boston, or Cambridge. Okay, so there's not that much time, so we'll get right to it. As I said, it's a deliberately provocative thesis that says the crisis that we're celebrating, a 10 year anniversary of this year, uh, actually goes back a lot farther than people think. And I bring to you, you heard a bunch of hats, in, in addition, serial whistleblower and former banker uh, and such and two institutions, which we'll see in the slides, some of which are UMKC slides, and some of which are Minnesota slides, and such, and every will give the same presentation twice. So this is the thesis of all of this, that the uh, same twin fraud schemes that drove the savings and loan uh, debacle actually continued. They simply moved to a sanctuary area called, nowadays, the shadow financial regulatory sector, although that name didn't exist at the time. And they grew massively over the course of, depending on how you count it, 12 to 13 years, hyperinflating the bubble and leading to the 2008 financial crisis and the Great Recession. So what were those twin epidemics? One was appraisal fraud. Lenders and their agents suborned and extorted appraisers to inflate values. Okay? Now that is something that no honest lender would do, and it's something that works really well when you're prosecuting. So, you know, I trained the FBI agents and the AUSAs who did the prosecutions in the savings and loan era, and as a federal employee, I'm free as an expert witness, right? So I did a fair bit of that uh, as well. Juries get it within 15 seconds when you explain, look, an appraisal, the collateral, is your great protection against loss as a lender makes no sense to inflate it, if you're honest, because that just exposes you to loss. And within about 15 seconds, you can see every juror is nodding to each other and going, yeah, yeah, we get this type of thing. So this is not only a powerful fraud mechanism. If it's detected, if it's proven in court, it's a good way to send elite frauds who think they'll never see prison to prison. Um, also, what we came to call the fraud recipe. Uh, for lenders, and I'm going to explain what that recipe is. We also saw how both of these could become epidemic. In other words, economics occasionally, over enough years, economists will admit that fraud might occur, but it would always be merely anecdotal, which is famous swear words in economics, 
and not worthy of study or certainly any policy intervention. They simply cannot conceive of elite fraud becoming systematic, widespread, important. That's bad economics. Of course, it's bad criminology as well, but we don't expect them to read criminology. God forbid. Uh, but we read economics. It's bad economics because in economics there's something called aggression's dynamic. And it was introduced by a Nobel laureate in economics. Indeed, the article he talked about it in led to the award Nobel Prize in economics to George Akerlof in 2001 for his article on markets for lemons. This is the same Akerlof with Paul Romer, who is not exactly chopped liver until recently he was the chief economist of the World Bank. For their 1993 article that they did in conjunction with us in the regulatory world on looting, as they called it. So we identified these two epidemics, and we identified them early, back in 1984, both by listening to our examiners, those are the people that actually go into the banks and look at the records, so the people who know the facts the best, they're not the fancy people in the organization. They're just the ones who are best suited to actually giving you the critical information. And because we autopsy every failure and look for patterns. So this is that passage from George Akerlof. Dishonest dealing tend to drive honest dealings out of the market. The cost of dishonesty, therefore, lies not only in the amount by which the purchaser is cheated, the cost also must include the loss incurred from driving legitimate business out of existence, right? And this is, of course, how we market this when we're talking to business communities, right? If you want to be an honest business person, you need someone like me stopping your competitors from cheating and gaining a competitive advantage. Because if you gain a competitive advantage by cheating, <coughs> the market forces become perverse. And this is a big deal, as I said, 1970, and Akerlof not only identified the concept for the first time in the economic literature, but gave it a name, a metaphor, actually, um, based on Gresham's Law, which he called Gresham's Dynamic. But being partially Irish, I will take you back to good old Saad. Uh, in 1726, Swift in this thing that you may have read as kids almost anywhere in the world, the Lilliputians look upon fraud as a greater crime than theft, for they allege care and vigilance, with a very common understanding, can protect a man's good from thieves. And here's why we still read Swift 200 plus years later. But honesty hath no fence against superior cunning. Where fraud is permitted or connived at, or hath no law to punish it, the honest dealer is always undone and the knave gets the advantage. In other words, exactly the same analytics by someone who had never studied economics. So, savings and loan crisis, at least we know on multiple grounds that it, in fact, was driven by fraud, or more, more precisely the second phase. First phase was driven by interest rate risk when Volcker um, shocked the system to break the back of the inflationary expectations. But the second phase, there was the inevitable National Commission to look into the causes. It goes by the ungainly acronym NICFER. Uh, and this is their key passage right at the beginning of the emphasis. The typical large failure grew at an extremely rapid rate, achieving high concentration of assets in risky ventures. Every accounting trick available was used. Evidence of fraud was invariably present as was the ability of the operators to milk the organization. By that last phrase, he means they found a way to get the money and convert it from the firm's asset to their personal assets. Right? So that's a remarkable conclusion written by a very economically conservative, not socially conservative, economist, right? uh, James Pierce uh, and such. And you notice that he doesn't hem and haw the way you usually see. He says, just flat out, it was invariably present. OK. And he talked about this massive growth. Well, how big was it? It was four times the, the industry, the savings loan industry, grew four times that of the banking industry, which is an extraordinary thing, dramatically greater than GDP, which is falling. 
at the time. But that underplays the story. Because the key is that there were 300 savings and loans, Kent, the frauds, each of whom was growing more than 50% a year. Now, the rule of thumb in banking is if you grow more than 25% a year, you're going to die. To give you some idea of scale in all of these things. And since your modern phones can be used to calculate this, you can take a look at what $1 billion with a compound growth rate of 50% will be 10 years later. It's going to be a big number. <laughs> okay? The growth was concentrated. It was not random. Texas and California savings and loans collectively produced more than 60% of the total losses. Just those two states. Yes, they're large states, but they aren't that, that large in terms of their share of GDP or any other measure that you want to do except fraud. And there was a reason. These are the two states that not only deregulated, but desupervised. In other words, it doesn't matter what the rules are if you're not going to enforce them, and nobody enforced the rules in these states in the critical era. So it was rational. You could choose where to enter, and you could choose which industry to enter, and nobody had a better environment for fraud and then the savings and loan industry, particularly in those two states. And this reprised mechanisms that we had seen before in the Texas Renobank scandal roughly a decade. <coughs> By the way, almost nobody at the agency knew that, the regulatory agency knew that. That was already forgotten knowledge. By the time I arrived in 1984, I had to learn it there. There was already in 1984 a huge glut in the Dallas Metroplex in terms of commercial real estate. Our Texas regulators were overwhelmed. California and Arizona were only slightly behind them. So what did our autopsy find? It did find a cons absolutely consistent pattern among all 300 of the institutions. We dubbed it the fraud recipe with these four ingredients. Okay? One, grow massively. Two, by making or buying, either way, crappy loans, unbelievably crappy loans, but crappy loans that had a high nominal yield, with emphasis on the word nominal, okay? with extreme leverage. That just means a whole lot of debt relative to your equity, and setting aside trivial loss reserves. In jargon, this is the allowance for loan and lease losses, the all provision. Okay. So one of the keys to this recipe, which would manifest itself in the 2008 crisis, was that it worked simultaneously for both the officers, not the institutions, but that is not people that make decisions. Institutions are not people. It works simultaneously for the officers of the buyer and of the seller of the mortgages when you have a secondary market situation. And it produces the financial version of don't ask, don't tell. Everybody knows it's crap. Everybody knows it's pervasively fraudulent. And that's why you don't say it. Because right? then you can't buy it or sell it. You can't make You can only sell in the secondary market through what are called reps and warranties. And you can't make a rep and warranty that says, hi, I'm selling you fraudulently originated mortgages. Please enjoy. Right? That doesn't work. You can't sell it. So if you have fraud in the origination process, origination process is making the loans. So that's the two primary frauds again, the appraisal fraud and this fraud recipe. There's no fraud exorcist. So if you start out with fraudulently originated loans and you sell them to the secondary market, the only way to do that is through additional fraud in the form of false reps and warranties. And that's why the Justice Department was able to get those multi-billion dollar settlements. So when I, you, many of you may have read that there was no skin in the game and it's all about securitization. No, there was enormous skin in the game. There were hundreds, literally hundreds of billions of dollars of skin. In the game. <coughs> so this recipe we figured out produces three sure things. And by sure thing, I mean, if you follow that recipe, it is simply math. You will report, the firm will report, and it will report promptly 
not just profits, but extraordinary profits. And so the worst frauds always reported the highest profits. Indeed, the two worst frauds in the nation in the savings and loan debacle, Lincoln Savings and Vernon Savings in Texas. Now, Lincoln Savings was nominally in California. Most of its operations were in Arizona. Charles Keating, some of the people closer to my age will recognize that name, uh, no doubt. Vermin savings, as we call Vernon, when we finally got through the political cover, had 96% of its loans in default. That's hard to do. <laughs> you really have to work to have 96% of your loans default uh, in those situations. So the firm will eventually suffer catastrophic losses, but what the else we learned from the numbers together with the analytics from um, the autopsies was, hey, this is an easy strategy to mimic, right? It's not hard to make bad loans. It's really quite simple to make really terrible loans. And what happens if 300 institutions do this? What happens if those 300 institutions cluster, largely in Texas and California? Well, then, very quickly, they will be extraordinarily large, extraordinarily large relative to the local markets. And property markets are relatively local. Right? And they will and did hyperinflate bubbles, particularly in commercial real estate in Texas. So we also figured out that the great tell in the sense of poker, you know, the dog that wags its tail when it has a good hand, is the tell of poker. Right? that the great tell was underwriting. Because if you think of the recipe again, the first ingredient is that you grow enormously by making incredibly crappy loans. But if you think about banks, or if you've had anything to do with them, or your family said anything to do with them, for over a hundred years we built banks precisely not to do this. All of the controls, all of the mechanisms are designed not to make bad loans, to stop people from making bad loans. And therefore, it takes work. It takes lots of work. You have to unhinge the controls. You have to pervert the mechanisms. You have to create a destruction <coughs> of your underwriting process. Now, you don't want to tell people that you've done that in the outside world, but that's what you have to produce. And therefore, our examiners were the best early warning tool. Because what do examiners do? They look at loan files. And they look at the underwriting, because we know it's the predictor of losses. And when they see terrible underwriting, that's why they were the ones who gave the warning. That's why listening to the small people in the organization in terms of you know, titles and prestige was the critical thing to actually getting the useful facts. And we know from economics that if you destroy underwriting, that you create what in economics in criminology is called adverse selection. And we know if you create this kind of adverse selection, to use fancy words from economics, your lending will have a negative expected value. In plain English, that means you're going to lose money. Now that's nuts from the standpoint of the firm, from the lender, but firms don't make loans. People make loans. And people make loans the way they're incentivized by the CEO. And the CEOs choose how to do it in very nasty ways. So the autopsies changed the entire way we responded to the crisis, how we viewed the crisis <coughs> in terms of policy. We were able to identify the frauds while they were still reporting that they were the most profitable savings alone in America. Again, Lincoln Savings, Vernon Savings, both reported at different time periods, they were the single most profitable savings loans in America. And they are front door to back door total frauds. Right? No ifs, ands, or buts, nothing in between. So that was very different. Right? Normally, there's a, when you're bank regulating, folks that are making lots of money and report that they have lots of capital, right? Those, that's supposed to be low risk. So that we reverse that. We prioritize these things that, uh, as Dan said in the introduction, we call control frauds. It's ungainly language, it just means this. 
to people that control a seemingly legitimate organization and use it as a weapon to defraud. That typically means the CEO, but for example, Charles Keating never was an officer or a board member of Lincoln Savings. So we said, whoever controls it, hence the name control fraud. But for the rest of the time, it's shorter to say CEO, and that's what I'm going to do, right? But translate CEO into whoever actually controls the firm. Okay, we learned what the Achilles heel was of this fraud mechanism. The need to grow, and not just a little bit, but to grow more than 25% a year. And so we targeted precisely that Achilles heel in our first major rule by restricting growth. We recognized that the bubbles weren't occurring on their own, that it was actually the frauds that were driving and hyperinflating the bubbles, and we recognized that they were bubbles and that they were going to cause enormous harm, and so we deliberately popped the bubble in Dallas. Right? Deliberately. And by the way, in terms of macroeconomics, Using macroeconomics to try to stop bubbles is sledgehammer time, throw everybody into unemployment. It's a really bad way to do things. Targeting the frauds that are actually driving the bubble. How many people have seen uh, the, the, movie, the recent movie right, about the, the big short? Okay. So how did they figure out that there was a bubble? Uh, talk to the people in Florida who were selling homes. To yeah, they went to the field and they found they're making loans that make absolutely no sense. People can't possibly repay them. Right? Economists, if you ask standard economists, they'll say there's no way to identify a bubble. You know, after it's happened, indeed, the most extreme say there is no such thing as a bubble and even afterwards, right? But that's exactly how you identify bubbles. And then you have to have the will. And that's what a large part of this talk is. You have to have the will to actually act. And I mean act, not preach. Right? So in the run-up to the 2008 crisis, there are all kinds of warnings from the government. That's one of the themes of this presentation. But not a single government official willing to actually do it. So what it was, was instead guidelines and guidance. By definition, as you know, under the law, that means they're unenforceable. But I will tell you, as a parent of three, it is equivalent to telling your 15-year-old son or daughter who they should be dating and then what they should be wearing. And you know, you're like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just prattle on, Dad uh, or Mom, and such, and then life will be what life will be. Uh, type of thing, and that works the same way. Uh, in a different talk, I would talk about the uh, econometrics, but anyway, the, the pride and joy of economists is actually perverse. They ended up consistently praising the institutions that were the worst frauds because they based it on reported income or stock price, which was driven by reported income. So we realized we needed, we needed a metaphor, and our metaphor was the regulatory cops in the beat. Right? So yes, this doesn't mean bashing people's heads, it doesn't mean bashing people randomly, but it means when somebody's committing a serious crime, back to that Gresham's dynamic, it's no favor to business people not to act vigorously to stop the fraud so that the honest folks can prevail. And we act really strongly. We acted proactively first to strike down that bubble, but then something that's going to be a theme of this talk, liar's loans arise for the first time, as with all good financial frauds in America in Orange County, California. In this case, it does so right around 1990. And we're kind of busy with this overall savings and loan crisis and this big fraud mechanisms that I was talking about and the 300 institutions, or the remainder, that were still operating growing at these massive rates, but we broke out of group because we listened to our examiners. And our examiners said, look it, they're not verifying the borrower's income. <coughs> That's crazy. It's got to lead to, they don't use words adverse selection, but they explain the concept adverse selection. And that means they're going to lose money. 
And that means this only makes sense if this is a variation of the same fraud schemes we've been looking at, just a different kind of ammunition, right? The liar's law. It wasn't called that then. It was a euphemism called low documentation back in that era. But the industry is the group that developed the phrase behind closed doors of calling them liar's loans. And eventually they stopped doing it just behind closed doors. They would actually go to conferences and call them uh, liar's loans. So we saw our mission is basically uh, beating that uh, Gresham's dynamic. And we looked at why CEOs were so different. CEOs can optimize the firm as a vehicle for fraud, but they can also change the external environment. They can extort appraisers. They can blacklist honest appraisers and only give work to appraisers willing to inflate the appraisal. That creates the Gresham's dynamic in other firms. And they can use compensation as a signaling device so they don't have the conversation that sends you to jail. Conversation that sends you to jail easily, even with inept prosecutors, is, hi, I will do the following illegal thing, and in return, you will give me the following amount of money, right? We can all send you to jail if we get that. But I can send that same message if I can even slightly clever as the CEO with the compensation system. And that's what the smart ones do, and that's why it can be much, much harder to prosecute them. But one of the biggest single things is we just don't think of CEOs They're as potential crooks. They wear nice suits, they're highly educated, they speak well, they give to charities, they went to the right schools, etc., etc., etc. Well, okay, after the savings and loan debacle, we had another massive amount of fraud, the Enron era frauds. And both for reasons of uh, shameless plugging and because it's actually, I think, important substantively, I'm going to give you the lesson of Vincent Kaminsky. Vincent Kaminsky was the chief risk officer. That wasn't his title, but that's what he was at Enron. So he's lead, one of the leading quants, quantitative experts in the world. And he was not a crook. In fact, he's in the books in Enron because Fastow, who was a crook, and CFO comes in, wants him to do something, talks to Kaminsky in front of the staff, fast out, the CFO leaves, the entire staff breaks into uproarious laughter at how absurd uh, this is, right? So that, that's the kind of thing we did Kaminsky. So a smart guy knows things are not right, but he doesn't know exactly. He writes an article fairly recently. He says, hey, risk officers, instead of making the mistakes, why don't we learn from the mistakes of other people where they've screwed up, right? And good early warning systems, right? That's what I talked about, it's early warning systems, the examiners. And he says, hey, I really wish I'd read this book. It would have saved me, but it also would have saved the firm, which is to say Enron, an enormous amount of money, right? And you go into bankruptcy, but first you report for a significant number of years huge earnings. I could never figure out how that happened. Again, this is a quant. This is someone really smart and really good with numbers who even after the Enron collapse didn't really understand what had been done to him. And of course, it's my book, rah. But here's the point. He says, hey, you know, I'm a quant. I did these really sophisticated algorithms. Who knew there's this obscure little guy out in the mid part of the country? There's a book and it explains, and without a complex algorithm, but it's math, how it works. And again, he's really good at math, and he goes, yeah, it, that's how it works. Who knew? Wish I had known. Uh, back when I was chief risk officer at Enron, it would have been a good thing. Okay, so, figuring these things out, not using just standard economic nostrums, was really helpful. Right? Because we were able to stop a really raging epidemic. I mean, again, think of 300 institutions growing more than 50% a year with assets in the billion dollar range, many of them, right? Over six billion dollar range. If you let this go even a few extra years, you start getting into really massive numbers and you start to get into really hyperinflated bubbles and such. But we did. We, intervened, stopped, burst the bubble, 
there was a debacle. It was widely called the worst financial scandal in U.S. history. But most economists think it produced no recession, or if it contributed maybe slightly to the 91-92 recession, tiny, teeny, tiny. So that's the economic debate. In other words, no very significant effect. But on top of that, we got over a thousand felony convictions. And these are only in cases designated major as major by the Justice Department, and that understates things. Because we, for political cover reasons for the FBI and the Justice Department, went into a really serious process of identifying the 100 highest priority cases involving the most elite defendants who did the most destruction. And you had to fight for your case. You had to really make a case for why yours should be this high priority. Almost all of those top 100 cases were in fact prosecuted against the best criminal defense lawyers in the world. America still did some things well. And we had a 90% conviction rate. It can be done. But to do it, extraordinary things had to be done. First, we had to embarrass the Justice Department into prosecuting. And we did that by making over 30,000 criminal referrals. In jargon, they're called suspicious activity reports, or SARS. And every month, we made public how many criminal referrals we made. And of course, the Washington Post started going over to the Justice Department and said, hey, there's 6,000 criminal referrals and there are only eight cases. What goes on here? And that happened month after month after month. You can imagine the Justice Department reaction. So they decided on this top 100. But once they did it, they found they could win cases. And then they incentivized the AUSAs, assistant US attorneys. They gave them top DOJ awards if they won top 100 cases, right? And people for that little bit of paper, that's a really, really big thing in terms of the Justice Department because people felt proud. They felt that they were really taking on elite frauds, the top white shoe law firms in the country, and they were winning. And even though the sentencing guidelines were much, much weaker in that era, overwhelmingly we were getting jail time, which is in that era was super, super difficult. So, this crisis, vastly, vastly greater. Same agency, Office of Thrift Supervision, that made over 30,000 criminal referrals in the savings and loan debacle, made zero in this crisis. I induced the reporter to ask these questions. Now, he reported back that the PR person for the Office of Thrift Supervision was mystified why we would, a reporter would ask the question and said, it's not our job to make referrals. That's something for the bank to do. Now, how many banks do you think make criminal referrals against their CEOs? <laughs> yeah, I think the same thing. So once they came around to this vastly greater crisis, at peak, we had 1,000 FBI agents assigned just to the savings and loan crisis. And there are, were at that time 3,000 FBI white collar specialists. Now they are only 2,500 because of the 9-11 reassignments. So one third of all the FBI white collar specialists, and we have, a, as we count industries, slightly over 1,000 industries in the United States, one third of them were assigned to a single industry. That's how severe fraud and how much they eventually bid in. But by fiscal year 2007, when there's epidemics of fraud raging, the FBI was given all of 120 agents. And they weren't in task forces, and they had no prioritization. There were three FBI agents here, two there, six there, at the 60-plus offices for FBI agents. So you couldn't investigate anything material. So they didn't. But being good FBI types, they did whatever came over the transom, right? They stayed busy. And then they kept on pushing the Attorney General to have a task force and prioritize. And Attorney General McCasey famously refused, saying, no, the cases you're doing are simply the equivalent of, quote, white-collar street crime. And he was right. But of course, he had assigned them in a way 
that all they could do was white collar street crime. <laughs> so it's a catastrophic thing. You can read a recent book that captures it in its title, The Chicken Chip Club. Okay, so one of the nice things, back to plugs, is Paul Volcker did a blurb for the book. And Volcker's like really big deal <laughs> in these things. And his point was Ed Gray, right? So Ed Gray was the head of the agency, a conservative Republican, a personal friend of President Reagan and Mrs. Reagan, who had never done anything progressive in his life. Right? None. Zero. He's somebody that smoked a lot and knew it was going to destroy his career, predicted it was going to destroy his career. It did destroy his career. So if you've ever read The Right Stuff, he didn't have the right stuff, but he kept coming to work every day and kept on doing it. Even though it knew it was going to destroy him, that's why Volcker wrote the blur to make this point. And that it was a lesson equally applicable now. Okay, I told you that uh, we went after the top reporting profits in the nation, right? Savings and loans reported the were most profitable. So, you know how law firms work, right? They're always pitching for business. You look for an excuse to write a newsletter to your clients, or prospective clients, even more, that says, oh, here's the following development to this you should look for, and you should think of us because we have this great intelligence and analytics, right? So, a law firm did that, and it was accurate in explaining who we were going after in terms of our prioritization, and including the institutions reporting the, the highest profits, and Lincoln Savings was reporting the highest profits. So you can imagine why Charles Keating, who effectively managed Lincoln Savings, was a little upset. And being Charles Keating, a lawyer, mind you, he put it in writing. The enclosed memorandum from the law firm of the chairman of the Federal Home Loan Bank is confirmation of a horrible episode in the American government. Namely, the Federal Home Loan Bank Board under Edwin Gray is Nazi and diametrically opposed to everything your administration stands for. He was writing to the President Chief of Staff, or President Reagan Chief of Staff. It goes on, the Federal Home Loan Bank Board is a prime factor in the current economic stagnation, which will lose the U.S. Senate to the Democrats in November. Can you read the enclosed memorandum and not be horrified at the police state Edwin Gray has created like Jupiter eating his children? That was us. <laughs> um, so he, he thought, you know, we were there to protect him. Um, that was, uh, we had a very different view of that. And what happened in the current crisis? Well, this is the inevitable National Commission to study the current crisis. Senior supervisors told the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission it was difficult to express their concerns forcefully when financial institutions were generating record level profits. Hint, they weren't. <laughs> the Fed's Roger Cole. A lot of that pushback was given credence. Citigroup was earning, no it wasn't, four to five billion a quarter. And that is really hard for a supervisor to successfully challenge. Oh, just don't do that. <laughs> Okay, so there's not a whole lot of folks left. You know, he heard um, or read Volcker's praise for the head of the agency, but the head of the agency is the guy that personally recruited the top supervisors for California and Texas. Why? Because that's where the big problems were. So he asked 30 or 40 folks who are the best supervisors in America, and he put them in charge. And they were the bosses of folks, and this guy, Patriarca, was one of them. So, Charles Keating being Charles Keating, and since a huge contribution for a senator is chump change for anybody that's a CEO and can use the firm's money instead of his own to do the contribution, he was able to recruit five senators who became known as the Keating Five to intervene and tell us that they really didn't want us to take an enforcement action against the largest regulatory violation in history, a kind of violation that invariably proves fatal. DeConcini, a former prosecutor and the senator hosting this meeting, saying that so these are 
He's talking about then when it were big eight uh, accounting firms. Why would Arthur Young say these things? They have to guard their credibility too. They put the firm's neck out with this letter, this letter condemning us and saying the Lincoln Savings was a poor put upon group. Patriarchate, they have a client. And the specific thing I won't go through. Uh, DeConcini, you believe they prostitute themselves for a client? Okay, setting. Five U.S. Senators, 120th of the Senate, led to the Keating Five Ethics investigation on the basis of my notes of the meeting. So there were five senators, all the outside law firms for them, including that Dowd guy that just uh, resigned, right? And the Senate historian and the House historian, all looking for some historical precedent. When five U.S. senators had privately called in the top regulator to put them on the carpet, right? They could not find that this had ever happened in U.S. history. Okay, so that's the context. And we've just been defeated in the House, and our only chance is in the Senate for the absolute critical bill needed to cut, shut down the frauds. And one of the Keating Five is the ranking minority, and the other is about to become the chairman of Senate banking. Which is to say, they got a lot of leverage, right? And this is phrased by a prosecutor such that a bureaucrat has only one possible answer. You believe they prostitute themselves, one of the top accounting firms in the world? <laughs> you should have seen the conceit. He wasn't, of course, shocked that the firm had prostituted itself. He was shocked that a regulator in these circumstances would tell them that. So that's the question. You think there are any banking regulators in the top last 12 years that would pass the patriarchal test if they'd been put in that setting? I don't think so. Okay, here was the correlation of forces that they say in the military biz. We did have an ally for a year <laughs> at the end of his term, Paul Boker, but we had a pretty impressive list against us. Let me give you just a couple of examples of how insane this is. The Office of Management and Budget, OMB, threatened to make a criminal referral against Ed Gray, the head of the banking regulatory agency, on the grounds that he had closed too many insolvent savings and loans under the Anti-Deficiency Act, which is a budget provision. Okay, that's pretty good. Now, the bottom line is about the California and Texas State Savings and Loan Commissioners. The Texas State Savings and Loan Commissioner, remember I told you about Vernon? and had Vernon, as we called it, 96% of its loans in default. That guy, Vernon had terrible records on anything else, but it had great records on the prostitutes it provided to the Texas Commissioner. <laughs> filed under a different category, a euphemism, but it actually had the written records for tax purposes so they could take a tax deduction for the prostitutes. <laughs> you gotta love it. <laughs> the California commissioner was more disruptive. He had a private business that was failing that was bailed out by Charles Keating's company, Seagram, uh, and such. You can imagine these were valiant allies in support of us when we crack down. Okay, and because of this, everything we asked for. I mean, I'm not exaggerating. Absolutely nothing that we requested from the legislature was passed. The one bill that emerged, they perverted into something designed to impair, and I don't mean kind of designed or inference, the lawyers for the fraudulent firms drafted the language, right? And there were all these congressional interventions, um, you know, Keating's famous, uh, he sued me for $400 million in a Bivens action, hired private detectives twice, and put in writing, highest priority, get black, kill him dead. He's a lawyer, remember. And then, withheld it as attorney-client privilege. <laughs> I think there's a fraud crime exception, but you know, I don't want to go there. Anyway, this, we got lots of support about this, including 
these guys, Akerlof and Romer that I referred to, who said, neither the public nor economists foresaw that savings and loan deregulation was bound to produce looting, nor unaware of the concept could they have known how serious it would be. Thus, the regulators in the field, the examiners, in other words, who understood what was happening from the beginning, found lukewarm support at best for their cause. Remember, this is 1993. Now we know better. If we learn, we don't have to repeat this kind of disaster. And here is the talk, actually. So I told you that Liars Loans, not called that yet, began around 1990 in Orange County, California. And that are kind of busy with the overall crisis, but the examiners say, you got to deal with this. So we break out some folks, and we deal with it, and we drive every lender that makes Liars Loans out of that business. And they were all savings loans at that time. Right? So they were subject to our regulation. And because they were in Orange County, and we were the regional regulator at that point, we could go after them. And that's why, in 1994, Long Beach Federal Savings Bank gave up its federal charter and gave up federal deposit insurance, converted to be a mortgage bank for the sole purpose of escaping our jurisdiction. So it could continue to make these kinds of buyers loans. And it sought sanctuary in what is now called the shadow financial sector, where nobody could regulate them. And then it proceeded to grow 50% annually for the next roughly 10 years. Such that by 2005, it was the largest subprime lender in the world with over $75 billion. Okay. So it was more like $70 million when it started. And it was up to $75 billion, and it was absolutely the biggest. And it became the model. Right? And, and you can see why they wanted to get rid of us in, in all of that. I would also note, in addition to the frauds, it was a predatory lender, and it targeted women, and it targeted people of color. And I want to tell you one of the most striking things that came out of the crisis, and this is from a very conservative economic source, the Reserve Bank of St. Louis economists. Median wealth declined by about 72% among Hispanic college grad families versus a decline of only, that should be in air quotes, 41% among Hispanic families without a college degree. Among blacks, the declines were 60% versus 37%. Now, the pattern is exactly the opposite for whites and Asian Americans. If you have a college degree, you suffered a lower loss relative to um, your ethnic group that, you know, of the household that lacked a college degree. In other words, these are folks who try to do exactly what you're taught to do in the American dream and such. Save, go to college, get a degree, buy a house. Right? And they're the ones who actually got, you know, absolutely got destroyed. And in a securities filing, one of AmeriQuest's, uh, AmeriQuest changed its name from Long Beach to AmeriQuest when it became a mortgage bank. As a mortgage company, the company was able to offer certain loan products that it could not offer as a thrift. In other words, as an insured, regulated institution. Yeah, that's why you left our jurisdiction. That's, that means that they were making loans that were not only subprime, but also liar's loans. They're not mutually exclusive. And indeed, the prospectus goes on. The stated income program, pursuant to which a prospective borrower's employment rather than income is verified, and the no-ratio loan program, to, pursuant to which a prospective borrower's credit history and collateral values, rather than income or employment, are verified. So they had two massive programs <laughs> in which you didn't verify any of the critical information. So back in 1994, when they first escaped, they made you know under 5,000 loans a year. But they were already growing enormously, more than 50% a year in even the earliest years. And they continue to that, as I say. And if you do get out your phone and use them as a calculator, you'll see what a 50% annual growth rate is going to do. And who funded these fund 
folks since they didn't have deposit insurance. Where'd they get money? Well, a national bank and a consortium of national banks led by somebody that is now J.P. Morgan Chase provided the key funding. They even predicted what was going to happen. The current level of gains realized by the company and its competitors on the sale of the type of loans they originate and purchase is attracting and may continue to attract additional competitors into the subprime mortgage market. Let me translate that. They were reporting extraordinary profits because of the fraud recipe. What happens when you do that? A bunch of other folks go, gee, I'd like that. <laughs> that would make me really wealthy. And they come in. Plus, they even got the next part of the analytics right. It was easy to copy this. Establishing a broker source loan business. In other words, you don't have to have brick and mortar loan offices everywhere. You just got the network of loan brokers all over the nation sending in crap loans to you. That's really easy to do. Low barrier to entry. Right? You can do that really quick. And what is this going to produce? According to AmeriQuest, increased competition could lower the industry standards for subprime underwriting guidelines. Yeah, like, remember that one I just read you about not verifying anything? They mean it's going to go down from that level, <laughs> which is already a level that will produce a catastrophe. Right? This is real. This is another one of those competitors that came in and did the same thing. This is their actual ad. <laughs> what do we use the three monkeys for? What's the next phrase? To see no evil. Isn't that an interesting choice of marketing? <laughs> right? Hear no income, speak no assets, see no employment, just come down, we give you money. Because we make a ton of money. All right, and God forbid, Tom Miller, maybe obscure, but he's the nation's longest serving state attorney general and did the key stuff in the investigation, said, hey, it produced a race to the bottom. And Eric West was right. You got a lot of perspectives as well, drawn. Okay. NQA, an obscure acronym, National Credit Union Administration. This is the federal regulators for credit unions that did an investigation. Nearly all of the largest mortgage loan originators in the residential mar um, mortgage backed security market between 2000 and 2008 systematically disregarded their stated underwriting guidelines. So, they also use brokers, remember, because that's easy to get entry. So we go to the guy who used to be the head of the Mortgage Brokers Association, remember? He's the head. He's not a disaffected head. He's the defender of mortgage brokers. And he says, we're getting a bad rap. Only about 50,000 of us were whores. <laughs> but, he says, of course, there are some big firms that are, what? Absolutely corrupt. AmeriQuest, the biggest and the baddest. Now, another state attorney general. Why state attorney general after state attorney general and not feds? Because the feds didn't investigate, and in fact, they quashed the state investigations by preempting them. And why? To attract, they actually used it in the literature and on their website, said, we're really aggressive in protecting you against nasty states. You should adopt our charter. So, Madigan, Illinois Attorney General. Our multi-state investigation with AmeriQuest revealed that the company engaged in the kinds of fraudulent practices that other predatory lenders subsequently emulated on a wide scale. What was that first epidemic of fraud? Inflating home appraisals and also lots of other predatory stuff. Hey, back to Ackerloff and Romer. They're writing in 1993, but they're talking about decades of experience. Loan brokers who match brokers and lenders in exchange for a commission have a deservedly bad reputation. The incentive to match bad credits with global lenders and to walk away with the initial fees is very high. Well, who knew? So what happened? So they massively used loan brokers. 
even though they knew it was producing massive fraud. And here's the real kicker. Okay? What's wrong with the AUSA? Gail McKenzie, not to pick on her personally, but as a mindset. It's an interview, I'm going to hire me a regulator back in the day, is the type of question I would ask to see your analytics. Ah, you didn't need the job anyway. <laughs> you get paid more elsewhere. So the problem is nobody makes you hire a loan broker. Why are you investigating the loan brokers? Why aren't you investigating the lenders, the recruiting and creating the networks, right? There are 25 of the lenders and 300,000 of the loan brokers. Do you think you have the resources to investigate the 300,000? No. Okay, so we're about to wrap up and do questions. Hey, it got better. For years, they didn't even look in Florida when they did. Oops. <laughs> they had existing criminal records. And back to Tom Miller. Who put the lies in the liar's loans? Economists assumed must have been the borrower. It's overwhelmingly the lenders, say the actual investigators. It's the originators that invent the numbers. So by 2005, that little acorn had become the largest lender, a uh, subprime lender in the world at 76.5. Who warned us about this? Note this warning comes in the year 2000, before Enron, during the Clinton administration. Remember when I told you how even juries that have no expertise get this within 15 seconds when someone explains? We were warned in the most dynamic ways. How about the industry? Whoa, sorry about that. Well, the, this is the industry's own anti-fraud experts with the ungainly acronym MARI. Stated income loans are open invitation to fraudsters. The incidence of fraud is 90%. It deserves the title used in the industry, liar's loans. Hey, remember back in the early 1990s when they first started, remember, and we cracked down? and they cost hundreds of millions of losses, industry acts like it forgets. And even the Bush administration, even the Clinton administration regulators are warning about this. Or nothing happened. So what actually inflated, hyperinflated the bubble? It was these kinds of loans. We could have gone two different ways in 2004. Congress, bless its heart, actually did something right. Passed the Home Ownership Equity Protection Act of 1994, which gave the Fed and only the Fed the authority to stop all liars' loans, even if the lender had no federal deposit insurance. The Fed refused to use that authority. And Clinton began the big first report on reinventing government, where he could have taken the experience of the savings and loan crisis and said, hey, this really works. And instead, they went in exactly the opposite direction. So that was the crossroads moment. Instead, they left it out into the shadow sector. It grew at extraordinary rates. They allowed it to go on for over a decade. By the time, well, they actually never acted. They simply had the crisis. Thank you. Questions? We have time for. So, there's a class here at 115. So just, just, we'll have time for a few questions and quick answers. Yes, sir. Who wants a yes? <laughs> Who wants a no? So um, there's a sort of famous story of you testifying as an expert witness and having the jury laughing at the government because it was one of these cases where it, I believe they're, the, the, the government has had this problem understanding why businesses would do this, why, why a financial institution would sort of engage in this fraud. Mm -hmm. Have you found since 2008 that there's been any, um, any progress on that front? 
And also, what is the way to get people to understand this is not about predatory borrowing, this is predatory lending? That's and multiple fraud. questions. So, so, so answer the first one is no. The context was a pro bono um, expert where we used the flying monkeys uh, because they were claiming that this lender was defrauded. We said, what? <laughs> type of thing. The judge saw it and he just, you know, uh, was amazed. Um, I tried with the assistant U.S. attorney, I'm sorry, the, uh, yeah, um, the U.S. attorney in Sacramento, who was actually a big week in these prosecutions. I wrote him. He never responded. Um, so that is part of what I do is show, no, I mean, the people that actually have investigated say it's not true. And it makes sense that it's not true because you would have to know so much information to be able to do it, and, and that information is proprietary. So the borrower is not in a position, uh, typically, to be able to do it. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't borrowers who knew damn well what they were doing. That clearly exists as a subject. Could you say more about the motivation for the federal government to withdraw any What's driving you in the SNL crisis? We have this very clear story of corruption. We don't have that in the bubble. Right. So, um, a couple of things, including uh, an ode to uh, Professor Jackson uh, here, uh, who actually tried to do something, um, and as an expert witness, uh, against the loan brokers. Because, in addition to everything else, the loan brokers got paid a kickback that they could <laughs> induce you to pay above the market rate. Of interest, right? And under RESPA, that's actually illegal. And so they were bringing a class action with him as the primary expert. Uh, so this is really good um, activism, I, I think, uh, by a prop that could have made a big difference. And the head of HUD adopted a new rule to say you couldn't have class actions in that precise context for the purpose of defeating that action. And that, Head of HUD is a guy that never was ever heard of again. His name is Andrew Cuomo. Yeah, the Gov of New York. So why? Because laissez-faire is ubiquitous, because the uh, Clinton administration came in with this doctrine of reinventing government where the analysis was the private sector was a brilliant success and the public sector was a disaster, and we had to have as maximum privatization and the thing we couldn't privatize should be run along private lines. Where I left the government in 1994 when we were instructed under the reinventing government, again I'm in the field so the folks come from Washington to instruct us, and we were ordered, and I'm, and again, this is a quotation, that we were to refer to the banks as our customers and to treat them as such. And in my own quiet way, I got up and said, I thought that was a really bad idea, <laughs> and explained why. And they said, well, yeah, no, no, we thought about making the people of America our customer if we had to think in customer terms, but we rejected that. Right? So, and they're very proud that the head of it says, Bob Stone, says that he got appointed by Al Gore, who was the, took the leadership uh, role within the administration, to run reinventing government because he made one substantive point to Gore. They'd never met before this meeting. And the one substantive point he met was, and I quote, don't waste one second worrying about fraud, waste, and abuse. Stop treating the, the corporations as the enemy. Now we didn't. I think that's, that's why I emphasize Gresham's dynamic. We are the best friend, the critical friend of the honest business people. We are the only thing that allows them to persist in the marketplace in these kinds of situations. But that's how the laissez-faire ideology got translated, that if you were prosecuting people, that wasn't good, that was bad, that was a failure, that was nasty. Shouldn't be doing that. And look what had happened, you know. Uh, so you met sort of along those lines, you also mentioned that uh, uh, yes, uh, so the, there's been a complica too complicated for right now um, where preemption has gone in light of Dodd-Frank, but it's been reduced. 
and the Supreme Court knocked down the farthest reaches of the interpretation that the Office of the Control of Currency uh, intended as to actual fraud type stuff. So, yes, and the state AGs have discovered that the only way to do it is as a consortium because they don't have remotely the resources and they can't ever really press it home. And the uh, analog of give and, and the point back to reinventing government that was utterly ignored in the reinventing government report was the huge success in public health, which was smoking, right? The uh, Surgeon General's report and the efforts by the federal government have literally saved tens of millions of Americans' lives, right? So, yeah, there are areas where we can do very effective things at the federal level and the state level. The, at the federal level, it, it, how many people know about the RICO action against smoking? Okay, so this was absolutely transformative. For 35 years, every private plaintiff against the smoking companies lost. Every single one. Then the states got involved and they did better and they got a bit because the key was the unethical representation of the defense bar which was hiding and destroying documents, right? There's ten, I mean, this is extensive federal findings eventually in the RICO case. Federal government finally brings a RICO action, a civil RICO action, and says the entire industry, every major firm in the industry is part of a RICO conspiracy and that the predicate underlying acts are they, something like 140 acts of fraud that they proved in the case. The opinion is 1,600 pages, the district court opinion. It's just a staggering thing. It transformed because it finally, the federal government had the resources and the tenacity and expertise to be able to get critical underlying documents and to dis able to prove that vast numbers of underlying documents were deliberately destroyed by the tobacco defendants. So you're right, we need ultimately the federal government, but if the federal government isn't doing it, we can't just go home. We have to ride the best pony we can uh, in those circumstances. And again, um, next time you see Professor Jackson, give a word of thanks for what uh, they tried to do. That uh, is going to have to be all for us now. Please uh, join me in thanking Professor Black.